Hi, this is Nick Dawson, the editor-in-chief of Talk House Film, and you're listening to the Talk House Film Podcast. It's always fun to bring two friends together for a podcast, as those conversations start at a point where others usually leave off. On this latest episode, talking with one another are two Brits, both of whom first established themselves in successful pop bands, but are now also acclaimed film composers. Clint Mansell is primarily known as Darren Aronofsky's composer, having first worked with him on Pi back in 1998, creating that film's memorable electronic score, and reteaming on all of Aronofsky's subsequent films, from the desperately bleak drama of Requiem for a Dream to the epic biblical spectacle of Noah. A versatile talent, he's also collaborated with a slew of other notable directors, such as Duncan Jones, Park Chan-wook, and Ben Wheatley. Mansell got into music as the lead singer of the pioneering alt-rock outfit Pop Police itself, but his identity now is solely that of a musician working in film. Jeff Barrow, on the other hand, is known to most people from the seminal Bristol band Portishead, but very quickly he's made a name for himself also as a screen composer. With his writing partner Ben Salisbury, he composed a soundtrack to the 2012 Judge Dredd movie Dread. While that music wasn't ultimately used in the film, it ended up as a record drock, and Dread's screenwriter, novelist Alex Garland, brought in Barrow and Salisbury to score his directorial debut Ex Machina, the sci-fi thriller which came out this past April. From their homes in LA and Bristol respectively, Mansell and Barrow talk about their creative processes on films such as Pi and Ex Machina, having a strong working relationship with the director, the difference between composing and being in a band, Ennio Morricone's low opinion of modern composers, and how 99% of films are, well, shit. The first two films I did, I both I did with, with Darren Aronofsky. Yeah, you know, yeah, of course, yeah. Which was like Pie and Requiem for a Dream. Yeah. And, and that was just me and him sorting things out. So it didn't feel that big a transition at first, working yeah. with him. When I went to work with somebody else, you know, brand new for the first time, that was when it really hit me. Because, you know, be, making movies with Darren is a bit like being in a band, really, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. You, you, have, you have that sort of relationship and you're just trying to do shit you think's cool, you know. Yeah, yeah. When you get involved more in industry terms, shall we say, they want to do shit that makes money, you know. They, they don't yeah. want to do, st- they don't do stuff that's put somebody off or alienates sections of the audience, even if it might be good, you know, they want to, you know, I mean, that, that's yeah, probably a little, little bit of a harsh generalisation, but in general, you know, you're dealing <laughs> no, with people. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, you know, you're dealing with people who, who probably come from a very different sensibility to your own. And so, you know, you've got to learn how to be, I won't say diplomatic because uh, because that sounds like, you know, you're just trying to fob them off, but you've still got to try and do the job that pleases yeah, them, but pleases yeah. you somehow, you know. So it becomes about broadening your, your horizons, I suppose. And, I mean, the thing I loved about going from film, going to film from, from say, pop music, for one of the better phrase, was when you write for yourself, essentially you can do anything, you know. But Yeah, you can, yeah. When you go to write for a film, you, you, you immediately have certain parameters that, you you know, that you've got to sort of work within and, and those sort of boundaries, if you like, even though, like I say, they sort of could sort of be fencing you in. Once you're in that fence, it's sort of very liberating because you can do anything within there. It's like having, you know, I think we were talking about Silver Day, I can't remember, but like, um, you know, if you've got a studio full of gear, you don't know where the fuck to start. Yeah. If you've got, if you've yeah. got one keyboard and a sampler, you, you're pretty much going to start there, you know what I mean? And it, it sort of focuses the mind and I kind of like that, you know, so... so th- did Dar- so when you worked with Darren and uh, Aaron Oscar, did he did you would, did he kind of put all the musical stuff in your hands? Is he very musical? Is he kind of like? Um, did you we, feel like you could go like, look, I've got this music sorted. We will do it together. But you you you've got me because you want to rely on what I can, you know, what I do, kind of thing, you know. Well, it, it, it's. I mean, we've done six films together now, so it's well, yeah, you know. Um, but very but, at the beginning. I mean, at the yeah, beginning of the relationship, you know. Um, you know, Pi, I think, was it was a very fortuitous situation that we found ourselves in. Not only that we, we crossed paths, and, and as I was saying, Susie introduced us. Yeah. Um, but 
we were very fortunate because Pi had they had no money, no backing, no industry, no real producers that had ever really done anything before. It was just you know just all newbies, if you like. So yeah. it was like really like making your first independent record to a degree, and you're just sort of yeah. doing the things that you want to do, but. Because Darren had no money, or they had no real money to make the film, he was he was editing it in in downtime in, at, at sort of edit suites that he could get some free time at, you know. So because this was in the days before you know Avid yeah. and whatever, yeah. you could do it at home. You had to actually start to go somewhere to do the editing, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I mean, I took him the first bit of music of, of Pi to play on cassette. I mean, good God, yeah. you know. Shows, <laughs> I mean, actually, it'd be pretty cool if I did that now, but. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, you'll be seen as some kind of proper indie eye. You know. <laughs> but um, I bet that'd be yes. worth something now as well. Okay. I, have you seen? Um, do you know uh, Horace Panther out the specials? Do you no, know he, no, he, I don't know him. Well, he does this artwork now that's like very sort of pop art thing. But what he does is he paints huge sort of like pop arts of, of people's cassette demo cassettes, and he's got like you know specials ones from like uh, you know. Uh, uh, the guy that they used to work with in Coventry and um, places like that, they, and he's done ones of like the Jam and stuff, and they, they're, they're really fucking cool. But um, but anyway, uh, he was editing through downtime when he could get, so it took him a long time to to edit the film, which meant that basically I had a long time to figure out what the hell I was doing, you know. And um, <laughs> yeah, luckily. And, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it took about eight months, I think, to edit the film. So all through that time, and plus the other thing was. He wanted to do a sort of, um, which I sort of took to be like a Kubrick type of thing, where he, he used pre-existing electronic music. Yeah. Uh, he, only, he only really wanted me to write the opening title piece to start with. But yeah. then, because he had no money and no real contacts, he couldn't get clearance on these tracks. So every time oh, one dropped course. out, I had to write a piece to replace it. And that's kind of how we learned the power of, you know, bespoke music for a film, if you like. And we just sort of figured it out ourselves and... Well, and it was the only criteria is whether we liked it or not, whether we thought it was doing yeah. what we didn't need what to a, do. So that was a really good way to learn. When you write for a band or you write for yourself, like the music, this has been my problem, um, is the music has actually been the most important thing. When you've got, when you, you know, there's, um, you've only got the music. So, or, you know, yeah. and vocals and you've only got the song or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So that is like the highest of the pecking order when you're making a record. When you're, yeah. in, a, when you're in a film, you're sat in a room with who, you know, the producers or director or whatever. I've, lo- I've been lucky working with Alex so far. But, um, but, but really, you know, it, music's way down on, yeah. the pe- on the pecking order. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, and also, yeah. And, and also, when you're writing, um, uh, what's the correct term for music that goes under, lo- under dialogue and, you know... Um, underscore. Uh, underscore. You know, I've never written music that no one notices in my life. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I want my, I want my every every note to kind of <laughs> hit to hit a backbone or a nerve to put people's hairs yeah. on their arms up. I don't, yeah. you know. So the idea of like, mm, yeah, we just need something, you know. To, <laughs> like I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see? Uh, you see that interview with Morricone where he was uh, yesterday? I think I read it where he's um, he's saying that. Uh, Modern composers are terrible. <laughs> modern film, modern film doesn't allow composers to be composers these days. There's like, uh, oh, he, he just rubbished everybody and everything anyway. Which just, you know, yeah, if you're in, right. if you're in a Morricone, I think you're probably well within your rights to say all that. You know, I'm, I'm, you, absolutely, I could, I couldn't agree more. It's just like, okay, whatever you say, mate. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not arguing with you. I saw X Machina last night. Oh, cool. Yeah, awesome. Fucking loved it. Absolutely. Thanks, man. Oh man, it's brilliant. It blew my mind. Music was great. obviously the music is great. I knew that already because I'd, I'd heard it. But um, but in the film, it just works so well, and it's you know there's, you, you get plenty of uh, ear space. In you know it, it sounded great in the theatre. I saw it in last night. I didn't go oh. for movies. I didn't go for movies twenty five. I um, I went and paid top dollar for it. But no, it was bloody great. Brilliant. Um, how how. Because, you know, obviously you had the experience with Alex on Dread. Yeah. That, um, that I, I, I imagine was very disappointing at the time, but somehow now I would imagine that you'd probably be, wow, that was exactly what the best thing that could have happened. Yeah, I mean, you know, ben, I mean, obviously Ben, I, you know, is my, uh, Salisbury's my writing partner. And, um, yeah. and, and um, yeah, we, we 
it, it was uh, going into the dread thing without being kind of negative about it. What happened was that um, as a, we uh, I got introduced to Alex through a mutual friend, and they were making the dread film. I was um, uh, I've always had been a massive uh, 2000 AD fan, and yeah. um, and you know as so much so many of us are, you know what I mean. And yeah, and, um, yeah. and, um, and you know it was like wow, this is really an opportunity to kind of you know smash a hole you know, in the world, you know, and, and, um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, um, and Alex was really behind that as well. Um, it was obviously the weirdest thing about it was that Alex was the writer. Um, but he, he also had an awful lot. It's a long, long drawn out story. Yeah. Yeah. But, but what happened was that, um, uh, there, there was kind of like a financier issue, um, that basically they wanted a, co- a commercial film. So, so me and Ben delivered, you know, what was uh, actually ended up being the album Drock uh, that yeah. we released, um, uh, and and they, um, uh, um, w- you know, so we started working on the film. You know, sat down there with the, in the edit, watching it, talking about it with Alex um, and everything else. And um, and uh, it, strangely enough, uh, the director that's noted as the director wasn't there. Basically, right. Um, we were always dealing with Alex and and um, and uh, the production company. So so we we um, and the editor. So we we went along with it, and then I think it it uh, something happened along the line. They said we want it kind of um, more uh, modern, kind of like you know, kind of more standard, really, as an action <laughs> movie. Um, and Dread is so close to my heart, you know, like yeah. you know. That we just said, look, we're not going to do it. Um, it's cool. Thanks very much for the for the for the you know for your time. Don't want to mess you about, but it's not going to happen. You almost probably want us to go anyway um, right. and get get a commercial writer in, um, and they did, and it was all worked out. And it was good, um, and so we kind of like left, and they carried on, which was um, and then. But Alex always said, look, next film. Just no mucking about. We're going to do it, you know. Which was, was always nice to know. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, super. Because we could have dropped him right in a hole by by walking out, and right. I, whether we made it easier for him or not, I don't know. But um, so the film was what it was, and it did, you know, it kind of like it did, you know, most probably worse than it should have done. Actually, you know what I mean? Yeah, because it yeah. got caught. It got caught in the middle between um, uh, a uh, uh, an, an action film and a, and a stark kind of trying to keep to the traditional dread thread. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so then Alex brought us in, like, as like, soon as he could, when he got the funding and everything else into Ex Machina, we, we, um, uh, we uh, read the script and we were writing to the script, you know. Right. Um, and to be honest, we spent 10 months on that film. Um, really? Which is which you know is a very long time. And how much? How you'll know this? What's the standard time that, that like a composer works on a on a film? Well, I think if you can get three months, you're doing really well. You know, um, well, three, yeah. three months I think gives you. For me, I like to think of it as like I've got a month to experiment, a month to really nail it, and then a, a, a sort of and then the final month to finish and prepare and fine tune, if you like, and to shit it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It basically breaks down into like lying around for two and a half months and then <laughs> panicking for two weeks to get it <laughs> What I'm trying to do, and you know, and I think maybe you'll, because like you know, you're on a great run at the moment because you're working with people. You're obviously working with Ben Ben Wheatley now. You know, so you're working with great people. You know, that sort I of. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, you know, you're, you're working with people who are, well, I guess, artists, yeah. really. You know, they're not industry people in that respect, you know. And, um, you know, and that, like I said to me, my experience with Ben on High Rise was just brilliant, you know. I mean, it just totally, I wish every experience would be like that, you know. Um, and I think, yeah. I think that's the secret of it. He's just trying to find people. I mean, it's, I guess it's recognising who you are yourself, isn't it? You know, like you were saying about Dread, you know, going, well, you know what? I know that's what you may need, but that's not really us. And we, you know, thanks, but no thanks. You know, and I think, I think having the courage of those convictions is, is, is the one step on the way to having less horror stories, I think, you know, and working with people that, you, you know, you, you, you're sort of in tune with, I think is a real big 
you know, just finding the right people to work. It's like it's because it is really to some degree like being in a band. And if you haven't got the right chemistry in a band, it's not really going to work. So you need to have that chemistry with the no. with the director as well. You know, basically, you know, when you, if you get notes from a director, um, I did this yeah. film. I did this film once called uh, Definitely Maybe. Um, that's a that's a romantic comedy and sort of you know well outside of my wheelhouse really. But Adam Brooks, who <laughs> di- yeah. but Adam yeah. Brooks who directed it, you know was really patient with me and he just gave me the same notes all the time. He never veered away. He just kept allowing me to sort of, you know, whittle away at it and get closer and closer to what yeah. he, he, he never he never diverted from what his aim was. You know, so so his notes were clear and consistent, if you like. And that really yeah. sort of helps you find your way through it. If if people does, start yeah. if people just start throwing, you know, shit at the wall, hoping something will stick, that to mm. me is just like, you know what? We're we're not in a good place right now because that's the type no, of thing. We're screwed, I, yeah. Yeah, that's the type of thing I might. You know, I said about having three months, and your first month might be experimentation or whatever. That's sort of what you're doing. That you know, and you've you got by the time you start presenting stuff to the director, you've already gone through a lot of things. So when some you know ass white producer says, "Hey man, <laughs> what about what about a bit of dubstep?" You go like, "Well, you know." We would have yeah. tried that two two years ago or something. Or whatever, you know. I mean, it's like you've got to yeah. have. Whatever roles those people are playing, they've, we've all got to be in, in, on the same page, really, you know. And that's the problem of, of um, you know, I was on a film, which I won't mention, which I later got fired off. But the music supervisor was in, you know, when at my place. He was, like, playing other composers' music to the director. I go, what the fuck are you doing, mate? You know? Yeah. You know, I mean, that's not fucking helpful to anybody, you know. No, so that's not. No. That to me is just going, like, you know, we're not in a good place here, you know, and you guys really better you know, decide what you want because we, we're not making, and you know, and I don't, I, I, I'm not a subscriber to, you know, you got these people like Michael Mann's one who has about 10 different composers all doing different stuff. And I'm just, you know what, that isn't fucking being a filmmaker to me. That's just being a, a person who can't, doesn't have an idea and can't make their mind up, you know. It's just bullshit yeah. and I, I, I won't work under those conditions because you know what, at the end of the day, it's just a fucking film, man. And, and 99% of films are shit. You know, I'll, I'll go. Th- <laughs> I'll go through. I'll go through hell and high water for a film I'm working on that I believe in. But if you're going to start dicking around, I go. You know what? This isn't getting anybody anywhere. I'm not. I, I, I don't. I, I don't work. I'm not one of these people that believes that great stuff comes from duress. I mean, um, yeah. experience and life emotions and all that sort of stuff are duress enough, and you can put those into your work. Working with a bunch of assholes, and he's kind of like, you know, this is a, this fucking film's going to be in the bargain bin in two days after it's out. So go fuck yourself, yeah. you know. I don't of course care. it is because because no, yeah, exactly. It, that's a, as I, I totally agree. idea of success isn't you know a billion dollars at the box office so no though that, though that would be very very nice the, the <laughs> idea of success is me for me is coming up with because like to me it's like when you see a film you're working on a film that you're really into you really love it to me it's almost like the film the music's already written you just got to find it you know and yeah and, and yeah. that film like say for you know for me a film like that would say be moon you know that it's like yeah, brilliant. Yeah, it, 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 it's what it is, you know. And like any any producer could have come in and said, like, well, you know, maybe we need a bit of this and that. And like, well, you know what? Maybe you do, but but this is what it is, you know. Yeah. This is the way it works, and and that to it's me strength. is strength. It is it's strength, strength of vision, basically. That's what it is. It's strength of vision, and, and as yeah. and if and if there's less strength, then you will get more people chipping in on it. That's basically how it works, doesn't it? You know what I yes. mean? It's just like. Um, yeah. If you go, I know if a director goes, I know what I'm doing, and I've employed this guy, and you give me the okay, and he knows what he's doing, so let's go and do it. Basically, if if it if it you know like anything, like a, it's like making a record, isn't it? You get an A and R man, um, you know, or you get Very a band. So. A band a band knows you know which producer they want to work with. 
he's got his vibe and he brings to that. And the band is strongly, they know exactly what they want to do. Then all of a sudden the A&R man and the marketing guy doesn't get involved. It's just like, no, you can screw off. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. we're making yeah. this record the way we do it. And you can deal with it how you want to afterwards. Do you know what I mean? Um, I do, and yeah, we're, absolutely. Yeah. But, but so, you know, uh, but, I, I definitely come from that school of thought as well, you know, that, um, you know, a horse bike committee is a camel, you know. I think too, too many people get <laughs> <Donkey>. involved. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if too many people get involved, you can really just, you know, you just end up really being wishy-washy, you know. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I also understand as well that, that I'm not, I'm not, because of these ideas and feelings and opinions I have, I also know that I'm not right for every film, you know, because I want to do yeah, yeah. things that's, that, that, I want to see a film and, and have it bring something out of me. I don't want to. I do these. Um, I do these sort of like talks occasionally for BMI. They they've got like young composers and stuff like that. And I've done a couple of you know just talks to about thirty young kids. You know, and I've said to them, I said, look, you know, if you want to, be, okay, you want to be a film composer, right? You know, whatever you want to do. I said, but you know, your best strength is to be yourself. I said because if you think, you know. I'll be like Hans Zimmer. I said, well, there's already 200 kids doing that and they're all better than you at it already, you know. you got to be yourself, you know. <laughs> be yourself. No, at- I, I, I do the same thing, actually, in music. Uh, you know, when I was at colleges and stuff and I've gone yeah. down and spoke, said the same thing, you know. It's just like, you know, don't, don't go off wanting to be kind of that artist, you know what I mean? Go off and do and be yourself. Be, I mean, you know, we sound like two old farts now, but that's something. Yeah. Hey man, but, the cat fits. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. The clothes but honestly, though, my, 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 the biggest revelation for me, honest to God, was just before I started doing pie, even when I was doing pie, I wasn't that confident of it, but I was going like, why don't my fucking tracks sound as good as the Chemical Brothers, you know? Their tracks sound fucking yeah. awesome, and why do mine sound shit, you know? And in the end, I decided, well... Well, I guess it's because they're the chemical brothers and you're not, you know. What 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 can yeah. you do, you know? And yeah. and, and that was a great eye opener for me, you know, to be able to go like, well, hang on a second. You know, I mean I, I you know sorry. These kind of realizations are, are massive, aren't they? You know what I they mean? Are. They just they just are. I mean, I'm massively into I was massively into kind of like American hip hop, but basically it's a you know, it's a white guy from Bristol. You know what I mean? Or not even from not even from Bristol, from Port Said. The, 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 the basically, I'm not going to be Chuck D. Do you know what I mean? And um, and so and so you use your strengths and then you develop. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, you know, um, the, the unfortunate thing is as well. It's like it's that whole thing of of with technology as it stands. It's like um, you know, you just get these you know sample packs. And it's yeah. just like, and it's every sound that you ever heard in film or on records is is at your disposal. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, so the thing is that no one ever sounds like themselves. Yeah. Because they just sound like other people because they have got other people's snare drums, bass drums, pianos. It's just yeah. like, if, if you take a, you know, a, a microphone, you, if you wanted a piano, you would have to go to your grand's house who's got a piano and put a tape machine in front of it. You yeah. know what I mean, and that yeah. would pretty much sound like your grand's piano. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, but that's what you've got, and that was specifically of yours. Now you just you just drag down a menu, and yeah. you've got you're on the same same piano sound as everyone else. So you sound like you sound like everyone else. <laughs> but, but that's it, isn't it? I mean, that, and that's why you know you have to keep digging into stuff and trying yeah. and making up sounds and finding something basically that because this is my problem um you know a g chord a d minor whatever in itself doesn't do anything for me but you know you get yeah. it on a certain sound or you you know you have a, a different har- harmonic against it or there's a rub against it, and suddenly you've got some sort of i don't know feeling or question or emotion you know and go oh hang on a second my my mantra is um, it's easy to score a good film. It's impossible to score a shit one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, well, it, unless I mean, you've got that trailer trailer pack sample, and then you can do <laughs> like. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean. I mean, a, a well directed, well written, well performed film. You can join in with that when you're trying yeah. to sort of cover up things that aren't working. You're doing things that really aren't what your job should be, you know, and it just becomes 
you know, like fucking working for the Red Cross or something, you know, you're just trying to yeah. keep, keep the body count down, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's so obviously, quite obviously tons of that because obviously you come into that money. I, I spoke to someone who was, who was a visual effects guy working on a big film the other day and he just, and he's a really genius bloke and he's just, yeah. he, and, uh, and he's just working on like a, it's a, you know, one of them massive, massive films, you know. And um, he just said, like, no one's in control of it. It's all out. It's completely out of control. It's a terrible film. It's like, and how can it's like, oh, my God, that's horrific. You know what I mean? It's just like... Well, when, you, when I was watching Ex Machina last night, and it made me think back to, I remember Duncan with Moon saying that, you know, they had a certain budget, and they sort of worked within that remit. What can we do? Rather than going, like, we've got five million, but if we'd had six, it would have been amazing. I'm sure there was lots of visual effects in X back in there, but they were seamless, you know, and you, 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 you were in the world that, that, that you guys had created. It was... No, well, excellent. also, Alex, Alex would have gone through every pixel. <laughs> 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 but, I mean, because Moon was a, was a, is a brilliant example of that as well, where, because that was models, wasn't it? Um, yeah, it was. It, but, yeah, I mean, yeah. When I, I, mean, I said this to Duncan at the time, you know, but when I first saw it, you know, um, it, it was it was amazing because it was sort of more Michael Benting's potty time than than uh, you know <laughs> fucking Blade Runner. Just just because you know we're just using the models, but they ha they have this like algorithm or something whereby I guess you shoot it a certain way, and then you know you got your model and it's going across the uh, surface of the moon, but you slow the film down to a certain whatever, and and it, and it adds weight. To the to the to the model, so it starts looking, it starts moving like it's now ten tons or something. You know, it's it's amazing what you can do, you know. Um, wow, it was it was brilliant, you know. You just see these things come alive in a sort of uh, organic, natural way, if you like, you know. That sort of yeah. having the physical. Isn't it really thing. exciting to be on? Yeah. Um, did, were you, how long how long were you on that film for then? Did you? So you were on it quite early as well. Seeing well, I, early I saw, stuff. It happened. was it, it was it was edited and the the film was there. I mean. Duncan was still fine tuning it, and a lot, all the effect shots were obviously still to come. So I was probably on that for about three or four months. I think it was it. It wasn't a long time, but it was a it was a good amount of time. But it was just one of those ones that just kind of it just worked. You know, like you say, the water was running the right direction. Everybody was on board. You know, it just yeah, it was just yeah. just great. You know, again, you, you've got nobody to really answer to other than yourselves. You know, and at the end of the day, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but. We're pretty smart people to some degree, you know. We we can decide, yeah, that's good. Don't really need somebody to go, yeah. yeah. But that's not gonna that's not gonna play in Del Moines, you know. And I'm like, well, you know, no, no, I know. That's, that's that's not my no. thing to worry about, you know. No, exactly. I, I suppose I look at movies the same way as I look at the, the the music I like. You know, I am looking for something that's I'm not going to say particularly different. You know? Oh, it I may, am. That's what I do. Well, I mean, but it, I mean it may end up being different, but but, but what I'm looking for is something that's you know, like like when you discover Public Enemy, you know it it is different, but it, it but it's it's not just that it's different that it's good. It's because it's a it's about something. It's about somebody. They yeah. really fucking yeah. believe in it, and they've given you something that is personal. You know, it's like reading a good book. You know, it's it's not just a a, a mirror image or a a blueprint of you know like we're saying about pop music verse chorus verse chorus middle eight whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. these people have gone off and done their own thing and explored it. You know, and that's. You know, and you're not going to find a great deal of that in in mainstream anything. No, really. commercial anything. No, absolutely. No, yeah, I think so. I think. I mean, the only place that you do find it is is in when you get real proper, like when someone from like black, you know, music America does something. You know, like right. like Timberland did, or or right. you know, like um, you know, when they like you know, like uh, Madlib. Or you know, like someone that really like turns beats inside out, you know, like Jay yeah. Diller, or yeah, yeah. or you know, um, because that stuff always then will end up relating to popular music, where kind of like experimental jazz or or experimental right. classical will will never really find its way into popular music. Do you know what no. I mean? It's like, yeah, I do. Yeah, I'm just thinking. Um, do you, are you got to go to work? Well, yeah, I suppose I'm. Um thinking about it you know i mean um yeah i'm uh i'm sort of I'm, I'm in that month of experimentation at the moment and uh um, oh, right cool uh and i'm i mean it's, it's a perfect example I've, I've written lots of stuff and i like it but nothing is really 
for me, I, I don't know what it's like for you, but I, I, this, this is sort of how it works for me, really. I'll just be fumbling around in the dark, lots of ideas, lots of ideas and things, nothing, uh, then something, something will happen that will just tie something together and I go, oh, I'm going to meet. And it's weird because it's like suddenly you get one piece that's kind of working and it, it, it suddenly shows a, throws a light on everything else you've been doing and going, oh, okay, yes. that, yeah. that could work. And, you know, but I haven't got that yet, so, um, you know. Stroll, yeah. you know, just sticking at it and uh, just keep writing and thinking and trying stuff, you know. Well, it's been cool. great talking to you. No, it's great. It's always good to talk to you, mate. It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. It's, so uh, congratulations on the film, man. It's it's really good. You and you, well, uh, you all should be proud. But you, you and Ben, particularly, well done. Great stuff. Oh, thanks, man. I yeah, want uh, no, and um, good luck on your on your next endeavours, which I've you know heard about, but I'm not going to say. And um, yeah, and. Uh, and you too, uh, yeah. you too. And and also you're coming over soon, aren't you? So Yes. Um, yeah, about six weeks I reckon. Brilliant. Uh, well we've got we've got to get together. Yeah. yeah. That'd be great. Go yeah, on. take care man, all the best and I'll speak to you later. Okay, you too. Cheers bye man. Bye. 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 This is Nick Dawson from TalkHouse Film, and you've been listening to Jeff Barrow and Clint Mansell on the TalkHouse Film podcast. The episode was engineered and edited by Elliot Einhorn. For more filmmakers talking film and TV, visit thetalkhouse.com slash film. Subscribe to TalkHouse Film and TalkHouse Music Podcasts on iTunes, where you can find all our previous episodes. And while you're there, please rate and review if you can. Hi, this is uh, Jeff Barrow from Porter's Ed and Beak and other things um, on TalkHouse, talking to Clint Mansell about um, shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'm Clint. Uh, yeah, as Jeff put it, we're talking about shit. <laughs> <laughs>